Hey, Barrett Edelstein here, your celeb expert and your celeb savant. Celeb Savant is a weekly entertainment show. We have long-form career retrospective type interviews with celebrities, singers, actors, and industry experts. On this episode of Celeb Savant, I'll be speaking to Chris Norman. He's an English soft rock singer and was the original lead singer of the English soft rock band Smokey. He left the band in 1986 and he continues to have solo successes throughout the decades. On this episode of Celeb Savant, Chris Norman. Thank you, Chris, for joining me on my podcast. So, Chris, where do we find you in the world? What's happening in your life and how are you doing? Um, I'm doing well. Thank you. I'm fine. Uh, I'm at home and um, I'm just uh, in between doing some gigs and, and promotion and different things, you know. And, and in about 10 days, I've got to leave and go and do another show. Then I'm doing a TV show. So I'm, I'm just in the middle of all that, really. Lovely. And where is home? What part of the world? Isle of Man. Isle of Man. Oh, that's interesting. And let's start, take it way back all to the very beginning, to the beginning of your journey in the music industry. What got you invigorated or in the creative process of starting music? And I know it's a long journey of many years, but let's look at the hybrid version of Chris Norman's story. Yeah. What started me off? Well, I... I um met Alan Silson, who was the lead guitar player in Smokey, when I was at school. And I met Terry there, too, who was a bass player. Um, and me and Alan Silson got a guitar each for Christmas by, you know, just uh, by coincidence. So we got talking about that and we ended up going around to each other's houses and, and just practicing and teaching other, each other this is chords for this. And, you know, and that's how the band started, really. Um, we started to do that, and then we started to play the odd gig now and again, um, little, little things like school dance halls or youth clubs or those kind of things, you know. And, um, and then Terry joined a little bit later on. We had a drummer called Ron Kelly, and then later on he left, and we got the final lineup then was Pete Spencer on drums. And then we were just gigging all over the, all over the country, all over the U.K., and um, made a couple of records, did some radio broadcasts, a couple of TV shows. And eventually, after a very long time, after about seven years, we, we, uh, we had our first hit when we signed to Rack Records. Yeah, that's, that's a little quick synopsis of, of the, the start to that. I know that you've released a number of albums, solo albums. Tell mm. us a little bit more about your current album. I read that it's covers of a, of a bunch of songs that you loved tell us about the album and what was your what was the thing that allowed you to choose those specific songs well it was um just an idea that uh, that somebody had to to do you know like a a cover of love songs yeah. so i thought well it could be fun because i've been doing like a, i did a studio album the most recently was in 2019 which came out end of 2020 and um i didn't really have anything to to do with the studio album i didn't have enough songs for that and so i thought well be quite good to do that. So then I took a long time trying to find songs because there's so many love songs out there by other people. And and so that I asked a few people, what's your favorite love song? Well, I got lists and lists and lists. <laughs> yes. um, and then uh, then I went through them all. And uh, basically, if, I also made my own list, of course. And then I started to find out the ones that I could sing best. And so I got it down to like, you finally got it down to like 15 or so songs and then ended up recording 12 of them. And I just picked the ones that I liked over the years um, that were not too schmaltzy. You know, yeah. I didn't want them to be too, you know, some, a couple of people suggested a couple of Lionel Richie tunes and stuff, which are okay for him, but I, weren't right for me. So I picked the ones that, you know, that I liked a lot and I felt like I could sing. And then I started in my own studio and, and started recording them and um, getting them to sound, you know, up to a certain point. And mm -hmm. uh, I played mm -hmm. most of the instruments myself. The only person I had on at the beginning was Jeff Carline, who's my guitar player from my touring band. And then um, I did some drums in Nashville and some keyboards in Nashville and uh, got a guy called Jake Burns to mix it, who's a, a great studio engineer, uh, mixed it and mastered it. And that was the end of that, and it was finished. And so now we've got this song, this album called Rediscovered Love Song. Uh, I call it Rediscovered because, uh, you know, people were saying, well, we just want to call it the Love Songs album. Mm. But, nah, mm. no, it's a bit, yeah. you know, it sounds a bit cheesy. So I, 
I thought, well, what can we? What are they? They're just sort of songs that I've rediscovered of yeah. from from the past. So we call it rediscovered, and then in brackets or not in brackets, love song, rediscovered yeah. love song, which is kind of what it is, you know. And you mentioned you had your album in 2019, and you've been releasing up until that point. So what continues to you to inspire music and create? What is that? element for you that's okay let's do another album let's create is it different each time or what is that journey of creating from zero to a full album well the difference of each time is usually who, who i'm doing it with whether i'm doing it on my own whether i'm looking for a studio album or some kind of a, a, a thing like this mm-hmm. which is a compilation of somebody else's songs so it always and and the, the reason i want to do it is because I, that's what i do you know I'm, I, for the last 50 years or something yeah. i've been um playing gigs um, and then later on recording. And so that's what I do. That's my life, you know. I, re- I do gigs and I record. That's what I do. Okay. I write songs. I mean, I'm already writing songs now. I'm, I'm actually, I was in the studio yesterday with, with new songs that I'm writing for, for way in the future. I'm not planning on making any more albums yet, but maybe in a year or two, yeah. you know. So I start writing almost to speak as soon as I finish the last thing. There's usually a gap where, where I can do it when I'm gigging or something. Um, and then if I start writing and I've got little ideas, I think I'll, I'll start to record some of those. And uh, that's where I am now. So it's just it's a pleasure for me to be making new music. I wouldn't like to be one of these artists who just goes out and plays old songs, you know, mm-hmm. constantly every week because uh, I find that boring. I mean, I do do the old songs. I do yeah. a lot of smoky songs in my set and some songs from my stuff. But I need new songs to to keep it fresh, you know, to yeah. keep it fresh for me so that I don't get bored with it. Yeah. <laughs> so now when I do a gigs, I, the, the, the songs are like a mixture between old stuff and I do like two or three old ones and then a couple of new ones and two or three old ones and I go backwards and forwards. Yeah. And that keeps it nice and fresh for me because the band, you know, they like to play new stuff too. It's exciciting for them to do exactly. something else. And for the listening audience to hear new stuff. I know a lot of times the listening audience, oh, we just want this song with this song. But it's inviting to allow the audience to hear, okay, cool, here's the old stuff. But listen, this is something fresh and new as well for you to listen and to add to your playlist. Yeah, exactly. So it, it's, um, and it keeps me current, you know. Yeah. Instead of just doing, oh, I'm going to go see Chris Norman and he's like, going to be playing those old songs that we've heard before <laughs> if there's something new and there's a new album out there'll be people coming who want to hear those songs you know so there's always people in the audience who only want to hear the new songs but there's a great uh, amount of people who want to hear the old ones too so i mix them up so i'm going to go back to the performances and live shows in a moment you mentioned that you've already started writing now when you write songs and write uh what is what sparks an idea is it personal journey observations of the world around you combination of both what is that spark of from nothing to a full three minute song well it's got to start for me with music so i I don't necessarily think i'm going to write a song about the situation that's happening in another part of the world or or something that you heard although that happens maybe sometimes later once i come to write the lyrics but the beginning of it for me is sitting down with a guitar or a piano and just sort of toodling about you know on, on a guitar just sort of trying to just play it and now and again when you do that suddenly you get an idea and you think oh what's that that's kind of nice what, mm-hmm. you know and that. Um, and that sparks off a song and when I do that it's usually a melody and maybe a few lines that have just sort of come along with with, with the melody you know yep. so I end up with a with a thing and I just wrote a song now called 16 miles from home and I, I had this 16 miles from home. It was like this. And I thought, what the hell's that about? 16 <laughs> miles from home? <laughs> What's that going to be about? <laughs> uh, so then I have to sit down and think, right, I've got to write this. the lyrics. I've got yes. the tune. I've got the verse. I've got the chorus. I like that. Um, I might have a couple of words like that. And and then I think, well, this is what I'm singing. It, it's not a bad title for a song, but what is it? what's it about, you know? So then you have to think, well, could it be somebody who's trying to get home from mm-hmm. somewhere or What's he doing? You know, so I have to get into it and then think about what the story is that makes him 16 miles from home um, and then write the lyrics from that. So that's how I do it. really. And is it a sole creative, pro- creative process or do you collaborate with other people when you create music? Mostly I write alone now these days. I used to write um, when I was in Smokey, I used to write a lot with Pete Spencer. Okay. We wrote a lot of stuff together. But when when that finished, we continued writing together for a while, but Pete was kind of not doing the same thing as I was anymore. Um, we didn't live near each other anymore. 
Um, so that kind of dwindled away, although I have written with them since then, but only occasionally. Or I've written the odd song with my guitar player, Jeff Carline. Um, if he sends me a, an idea that he's got, and I think, oh, I like that. So um, I did a song on the last album uh, called Good Enough for Rock and Roll. And um, he had that basic riff. It was a guitar riff type song. And he had that and sent me it. And, and so I, I got hold of that then and finished it off and wrote some lyrics. And I wrote a, a, a hook line in the middle. So sometimes I do write with other people, but most times... Um, these days, it's just on my own. Going back to the concerts now, I'm very much a person who loves going to concerts. I'm the person loving standing right in, right in front, having a absolutely... That was you, was it? Yeah, it was me every time. <laughs> <laughs> so in South Africa, there's a word called Joel. I love, we go for a Joel, um, so J-O-L, for oh, those overseas listeners. Um, so we go right in front, and I've got my cell phone in my pocket, I'm this just there enjoying myself, dancing, having so much fun. And I look at the people around me and it's so frustrating because every person's got their cell phone out trying to get those perfect images, perfect shots, perfect videos. And like, put your phones down, be in the moment. The person's right there. Just let that be the, what it is. From your yeah. perspective, seeing just a sea of cell phones, what is that space for you on the receiving end of that? Well, you're right about that. I, I think that sometimes when I look out at the audience and there's, Whenever I do a gig anywhere, there's always like a couple of hundred sort of fans that come to every gig nearly. Mm. Um, they're usually the first people I can see at the front. And most of them or very many of them are filming me all the time, <laughs> you know. And, and I'm thinking you, you're kind of missing it, really. You, yeah. you, you're watching, you, you're looking at your phone to film it and you're missing the show, which is right there in front of you. Yeah. So I agree about that. Um, when I go to a concert, I, I never do that at all. You know, I just want to see the band and, and get into it or the artist, whoever it is. So, yeah, I don't know. That's a modern day thing, isn't it? I mean, people want to. And the other thing is when you, you know, when you, they're waiting for you outside the hotel or outside the gig to, and you just few autographs, they always want a picture, you know, give them a picture, give them a picture. So you, I, I see these same people all the time and do a picture with, oh, yeah, okay. And, and I sometimes say, how many pictures have you got now? <laughs> that looks exactly like this, you know, with you and uh, me with my arm around you smiling into a camera doing a selfie. You must have a thousand of them by now. They all look exactly the same if you lined them up. But for them, it's kind of like, a, I, I guess it's like a diary. Yeah. Whether this was this town, this was this town. Mm. And um, yeah, like I say, it's a modern day thing. People want to film and take photographs with their phone. You can now. You never used yeah. to be able to do that. Yeah. We're, like, we're, we're doing this now with the same thing. This is all like a new thing over the last few years that we, we never would have thought of. You know, when I used to go to concerts when I was young, you didn't have the opportunity to do that. You didn't have like a phone in your pocket that you would take good photographs yeah. or film or, you know. So it, it, I guess people can do it, so they do. And you speak about technology and that. So when you first started creating music, we had, and I'm so grateful and so excited that these are coming back. So we had vinyls and cassettes, CDs. I love me a CD. I always buy my, <laughs> buy my CDs. But now we have these digital platforms. Like I said, mm. um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but last year they announced that or the sales were that. And the first time in 21 years, CDs had grown in sales. So I was very excited about that because for me, I love holding the thing, the pages, the aesthetics, seeing the pictures, seeing the music mm. lyrics. What is mm. your perception of the digital platforms and the way now listeners are consuming music well it's just like one of the things again like we were talking just talking about really yeah. that it, it's just an, an a thing that's inevitable these days you can't um record companies now want to put want to go onto that digital platform they want to get on onto spotify and youtube and and use all those kind of um social media to to promote the records but also to, to have downloads for them so that um I don't know why. I guess it's because it costs more to produce a CD, to produce the packaging for a CD, the artwork, the, the actual pressing of the, of the CD and, the, and the, the case and everything. You have to do all that. And this way you don't. You just put it online and people can just click on it and get it. But I'm, I'm with you. I mean, I, if I buy an album, I want to I see who played what. I want to see the lyrics maybe i want to see you know i want to have a piece of well plastic i don't know what it is but but that yeah. and i still like vinyl records you know that they're, they're beginning to make a little bit of a comeback but it's only a minority now that, of, of the sales of vinyl i prefer that physical uh, product that comes out but you know no matter what i say or argue about with the with the management and the secret record company i'm saying why are you going to put it on there you know 
I mean, the last album, they put the whole album on YouTube, track after track, the whole album. And I, I, I said, what, what's that for? I mean, if you do that, why would anybody buy the bloody record? Yeah. They've already got it. They've only got to do is go on YouTube. They can hear the whole album over and over and over and over again. Why do they need to buy the album? You just, surely you're cancelling out sales here. Yeah. But that, that's what they do, these sort of things now. I don't get it, really, but they, they do it. And so you've got to kind of, I now am thinking, okay, we, we do, you do what you think you should do, but let's not give away the whole album. And also, let's make sure we're doing a promotion in the old-fashioned way, the TV shows and the radio things and everything else, so that people who weren't looking for it can also be aware of it, you know? Yeah. Because otherwise, I mean, you know, they say, well, it's on Spotify. Yeah, but you have to go and put my name in and put the album in. If you don't know about it, how are you yeah. going to put it in, you know? So you have to do both. It's a balance. Um, and it does definitely mean that, that there's no, you don't sell the amount of records or CDs that you used to, unless you may be Adele or something. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I, I for me, I, I liked it better before. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and I don't very use I don't use it myself very often. I I, I if I hear a song or, or an album, I I go and buy it. You know, it's interesting because I have my Spotify accounts and I have the premium for the simple fact is that so I teach spinning classes and I create playlists for those spinning classes. But I've created the playlist like two, three years ago. And when I go back into the playlist, now all of a sudden a, a song has been removed of the of the playlist. Whereas if I've got the C D it's always mine. It's always there. No one can take it off my yeah. account. It's in my yeah. on my CD rack over there. So yeah, it's, yeah, I suppose it's a balancing act these days. But it's just also making sure that you guys get paid what you're supposed to. I've heard that you know these platforms don't pay great amounts or properly. No. So the idea of making used to be when I when I first started out, you know, with having starting having hit records and albums and stuff, you used to make the money was coming from the record thing and you did the tours to promote the record yeah. and then you'd make the money from the sales. It's the other way around now, really. It's almost like the CD is promoting the tour. So then you make the money on tour. You don't expect to make that much from the, from the record like you used to because, you know, if, for instance, on Spotify, I don't know what the percentage is, but, you know, people pay a subscription to Spotify for everybody. So if they yeah. watch, if they download your album, it's a minute amount of money that you get for that, you know, because it spreads through everybody. So, yeah, there's not a lot of money in those kind of things anymore. You make money on tour now. And what is your perception of social media? Well, I don't, I'm not really that big a social media person. I mean, I've got all the things that you're supposed to have. I've got a Facebook account and a TikTok account and a whatever it is, you know, all yeah. those things. I've got all, I've got all that, <laughs> but I didn't set them up. My management set them up because you have to have them. People want a platform that they can contact you on or write um, comments on and everything. So, I, you know, I get that. I, I do check Facebook every so often, I'm maybe a couple of three times a week, just to see what anybody's putting on about, especially if I've got something new coming out, mm -hmm. see if anybody's made any comments about it or see what anything else is all about. But I never actually send messages, hardly ever. I say I'm never. If it's something important, I want to make an announcement, you know, like if somebody's scamming something and I want to say, don't take any notice of this particular thing, because it's not me, it's a scam. Then I'll do a, a thing, but I don't use Facebook like most people do, where they keep writing messages to each other. Yeah. I don't do it. I just, I'm not interested in doing that, you know. So um, I'm not a big participant in yeah. social media. Now, how did you get involved in the Licorice Pizza uh, soundtrack? Um, the song with Susie Quattro. I, to buy, by the way, I interviewed Susie a couple months ago for our show. So there's some commonality there. Uh, so how did that happen? Are you still in contact with her? Are there any other artists you'd want to collaborate with that you haven't? A whole bunch of questions in one. The licorice pizza thing, I have no idea that it was on there. Okay. Um, and I, until I got, um, uh, somebody asked me the question, what do you think about the, the stumbling in being on, and I said, on what? <laughs> I said, on licorice, licorice pizza. I said, what is that? <laughs> so it's a movie. I said, I've never, I didn't, I had no idea. So, you know, these things are done behind scenes. I don't yeah. know. Some publisher or whatever must have done a sync with that movie, and suddenly it's on. And I, I think I was. It was about a month later before I even knew it was on there. But um, so it's, it's not really something that me or Susie have got any sort of thing to do with. Really, it just happened. You go, oh, that's nice. There was um, uh, another Netflix. It's a Netflix series, I think, about that uh, serial killer, Dharma. Oh, Dharma, yes. Yeah, and that my daughter uh, called me the other day and she said, 
I was watching Dharma. Have you seen that? I said, no. She said, it's about the series. Yeah, I've, I've seen it advertised. I said, no, I, I, I don't fancy it. Really. She says, oh, I was watching it. And in the third episode, he's driving along in his car and the ra- radio's on in his car. And it's Casey Kasem, you know, from America. Yes, who yeah, used yeah. To do the chart show. And he says, uh, and he goes, America's top 40. And then it is, and at number four this week, it's Chris Norman and Susie Quattro were stumbling in and the record <laughs> comes out. I'm thinking, oh, wow, this is cool, you know. Yeah. And they played about a minute and a half of it, too. You know, usually they, you get like a line and then they go into dialogue. Yeah. This was like for a minute and a half, first of all, on its own. And then there was a bit of dialogue you could hear in the background. Then it came back to it. So I thought, that's cool, you know. Uh, I love I love stuff like that. I mean, really, it's so cool when you put something on and you go, oh, didn't know, you know. Yeah. You've collaborated with Susie. Are there any other artists that you want to collaborate with? Well, I, you know, I've done a few collaborations yeah. over the years. The last one was, well, actually, I was just going to do one with Bonnie Tyler. I wrote a song called Battle of the Sexes. And uh, we were going to do a duet together. We talked about because I've seen Bonnie quite a few times over the years. I, you know, I do. I'm doing a show with her actually coming up. I think in November. And every now and again, I, you know, I know her pretty well for over the years, and her husband. And um, we talked about doing a, a duet together. So I thought that would be cool. Me and Bonnie, you kind of voices are similar, you know. So I, I sent her about three songs, three or four songs, and uh, one of them was this Battle of the Sexes which she picked up on. And, and so she got in contact with me. She said, I'd love to do Battle of the Sexes. I think that's a great song. I said, okay, let's do it. But she said, what do you think if I do it with Rod Stewart? <laughs> <laughs> I said, what? What? She says, but can you imagine how, if it takes off how, how many records it sell in America? And so I, 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 first of all, I thought, oh, I'm not sure about that, you know. And then I talked to um, a couple of people and they said, well, Rod Stewart and Bonnie Tyler might be massive, you know. So, so I said, okay, go and do it. So that was supposed to be a, a duet with me and Suze, uh, me and uh, Bonnie, and um, turned out being a duet with her and Rod, and it was on oh, her okay. last album. But yeah, it's cool. You know, I, I don't care. It's, it's, it's good. It's just, I wrote the song, so That's money. Cool. Money, <laughs> money, money, money. <laughs> <Like that. laughs> so now tell me a little bit about your experience of South Africa. I've never been. Never? Never. Smokey in the, in the time when I was in them, we were asked to go and do a couple of shows like Sun City and mm-hmm. things like that. And at that time, it was like considered not very cool to do that because of apartheid and everything. So we never went. Later on, when I'd left Smokey, I left, remember I left Smokey in 86. Yeah. And it wasn't until after that. I don't know when they first went out there, but, um, but uh, maybe in the 80s or 90s. So they've been a few times and um, they, they actually do quite well there, I think. Although there's nobody in Smokey now that was in the original band. But nevertheless, they, they've done it, but I've never been. And uh, when I saw that the fact that they were successful there, I said to my manager, you know, I, I'd like to go there, you know, see if we can get. But I think because they don't have, with me, they don't have the smoky name, you know. So, so far it hasn't happened. But, uh, you know, if you know anybody who wants to do a tour with me, I'd be happy to come. I'd love to. Putting it out there that you're coming to South Africa. I'll be there right up in front without my cell phone <laughs> cheering you yeah. on. And then we'll go for yeah. drinks afterwards. How does that sound? <laughs> good idea. Good idea. Sounds good to me. You, you arrange it. I'll be there. Okay, perfect. Let's try and see what we can do. Chris, the podcast is listened to South Africa. Main audience is in the UK and USA, actually. So USA, UK, USA, Belgium and Germany, all around the world. As a final message to the listening audience, what would you like to say? Well, the first thing that I would probably think I should say is thank you very much. Because, you know, I started this job, if you like, career. When I was 17, I turned professional and went into this thing. And it was like a, an open book in front of me. I didn't know what was going to happen. And since then, I've been in the business ever since. And I've been lucky enough. It comes in spurts, but nevertheless, I've been lucky enough to sell a lot of records. Um, and then I had a solo career, which uh, I'd sold some more records. And I've been touring ever since, pretty much off and on. And without people actually enjoying what I'm doing and buying the records, none of that would have been possible. So I guess I, I should say thank you very much to everybody who bought a record ever that I was involved with. Chris, this is Celebs Front signing out with Mr. Chris Norman. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.